Shalom. Welcome to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio today by Mark Finkelstein, and we will be joined uh, via Skype by uh, Jonathan Spire, uh, contacting us from Israel uh, in just a few moments. Uh, we'll begin with the world in five minutes, just going over what's going on in the world here on Understanding the World. And uh, the big talk, of course, is the debt ceiling and the shutdown that is currently in place uh, in Washington, the absence of uh, talks between the Republicans and the Democrats, particularly between the Republican leaders of the House of Representatives and the President of the United States, uh, and kind of brinksmanship that's going on, the incredulity uh, on behalf of the White House that the Republicans would be willing to not raise the debt ceiling and, and uh hope that the consequences are not as catastrophic as some make them out to be. And other people are saying, well, even if, even if the U.S. doesn't uh, default on foreign debt, there are any number of contracts that the U.S. has uh, got in place that wouldn't be paid off if, uh, if the debt ceiling isn't raised and the government will start to have to figure out how to pay what, and you have a big mess if that happens. Uh, but that's in addition to the shutdown. Right now, the federal government is also shut down. A number of federal programs are shut down. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I look at this stuff on the debt ceiling, the threat on the debt ceiling at this point, I think, is, is tantamount to a child holding their breath to try to get their way. I mean, eventually you're going to breathe. Uh, if you don't breathe on your own, you're going to pass out and then breathe on your own. And there, there's no way the United States is going to move forward without paying its debts. So this is... The, the not raising the debt ceiling is 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 simply not going to happen as far as is what a, a solution to the process. The shutdown, on the other hand, uh, it just depends on how long the Republicans want to continue to piss off people uh, who need to get money from the federal government or want to access federal programs. So in the long run, that's not going to work either. Uh, so th from my mind, it, as long as the Republicans can keep this idea of the level of debt uh, and, the, and that we need to reduce the debt and that, um, uh, that concerns about um, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, depending on which title you want to pick, uh, as long as they can keep that on the table in the forefront, uh, they may well continue with the shutdown strategy. But as long as the focus becomes on the debt ceiling and the shutdown and they're not even able to talk about those things, uh, they're losing the they're losing the public discussion, and I think that's where things are right now. That they've already lost the discussion, with the exception of uh, fairly uh, conservative media. There's no discussion of any of the substantial issues going on here. It's only about the impact of the debt ceiling and the shutdown. If that's the case, the Republicans aren't gaining anything. They're only losing by continuing what's going on. Uh, but there are other concerns that I have, and I think in the world in five minutes, this is a really important thing that I want to bring up, and I want to bring it up with Jonathan as well. Um, the United States, in this situation here, we're talking about the shutdown of the debt ceiling, comes on the heels of the president bringing a foreign policy decision to act against Syria to the Congress and having the Congress say that they didn't want to do anything. Now, when you add that, that vote in Congress on, or the, the vote that didn't happen in Congress on Syria, to serious financial concerns in the United States, to politically is isolationist tendencies uh, in the United States, now on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, who are, f who are concerned about getting us involved in anything overseas. And in addition to the war weariness that we already had, and a desire of this administration to work through inst international uh, institutions and foreign policy. Um, we're in a situation in which uh, anything much more than the use of drones or special ops forces uh, would seem to be almost impossible to imagine. Uh, and threats of significant military action against Iran, for example, if they don't uh, uh, move forward uh, with negotiations on uh, their nuclear arsenal um, would seem to ring very hollow right now. That, that, that the, United, the threat there, the threat just doesn't seem to be there. And when, when you're going to be engaged in uh, diplomatic negotiations, not having that threat is almost catastrophic to the negotiations. So I'm wondering what Jonathan will say about that. I wanted to make the point here before I forget to. Uh, and um, 
Uh, we're really looking forward to having Jonathan Spire join us, a uh, columnist for the Jerusalem Post, um, uh, one of the uh, people involved with the Gloria Center as a, a researcher in the Middle East, uh, author, commentator. Uh, we will learn a lot from Jonathan Spire right after this break. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I am the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna wanna know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I wanna find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not gonna have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. Shalom. Welcome to Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman. I'm joined in the studio by Mark Finkelstein, and we uh, will be joined in a moment by uh, Jonathan Spire, who is a columnist for the Jerusalem Post, senior researcher at the uh, Gloria Center in Israel, and expert on uh, all things Middle East. Um, before we start uh, our conversation with uh, Jonathan, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Ronald Bergman and Bergman Folkers Cosmetic Surgery and Spa for their continued support of this program, enabling us uh, to, uh, to have guests like Jonathan Spire on the show and to continue uh, to help people understand the world better. So, uh, Shalom, Jonathan. Uh, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Hello, David. Yes, good to be here. So uh, there, there are any number of topics that we can, uh, we can get into today. And, and I, I don't know, where, where do you want to start? We, we've got uh, the, the United States uh, basically saying that they're going to withhold uh, foreign aid from Egypt, or at least a portion of mm -hmm. the military aid from Egypt. We've got Syria. We've got Iran. Uh, we've got the peace process. Pick a topic. <laughs> Let's just get well, into something. There's certainly lots that we can talk about, and all of it, uh, in the end, I think, comes back, you know, often to very similar uh, processes involving similar players in the end. So I'm happy to start wherever you'd like to. But I should say that uh, much of my daily work is spent on Syria, which is probably my 
a central interest right now. So well, I'm let's start to there. Then we'll start there. Yes. But let's start there. So what what's going on in Syria right now? I saw an article that you posted the other day about Saudi Arabia doing some stuff in 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 Syria, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, the Saudis are uh, really increasing their uh, involvement on the rebel side. And on, on the 29th of uh, last month, there was the announcement of this formation of this new. A military bloc called the Islam Army, or Jaish al-Islam, uh, bringing together around 50 uh, brigades and battalions around the Damascus area under the command of a guy called Zahran Alush, who is closely linked to the Saudis. And this is a, a, an evidence that, one, the Saudis are increasing their own involvement uh, on the Syrian, uh, in the Syrian uh, conflict, but secondly, that they're doing it without consultation with, uh, and without cooperation with the United States of America, which has its own uh, program of activity in Syria. And this to me is very significant because it shows us the extent to which the Saudis have lost confidence uh, in their American allies and their ability to deliver and have now sort of taken it upon themselves to organize their own program of assistance to the Syrian rebels. So we can talk in much greater detail about that, but that I think is the, the very telling point here which I think is reproduced in other countries and other situations also across the region. Hi, Jonathan. This is Mark along with David. Um, Hi, Mark. You mentioned in your article that Prince Bandar is p part of the, uh, the group that's pushing Syria, uh, pushing Saudi Arabia to, to work against Syria. What mm -hmm. relationship did Prince Bandar have with the American administration during his tenure as ambassador? Well, Prince Bandar goes back, you know, a long way, as you correctly, you know, note in your question, with, with the United States uh, as a former ambassador, and also going further back in his early part of his career as one of the people helping to coordinate aid to the uh, Mujahideen in, Af in uh, Afghanistan. And Prince Bandar is somebody who's also closely acquainted with uh, the Bush family and was clo and was closely acquainted with the uh, with uh, the second uh, pre both President uh, Bushes, both uh, you know, 41 and 43. So this is a guy who spent a lot of time in America and who has, you know, I think as much as any other Saudi has been deeply involved in a, a political and diplomatic uh, activity, we can say, ever since the 1980s, uh, including some of the most clandestine and, and sort of behind the scenes uh, episodes of the last uh, two or three decades. So a guy who knows America well and somebody who also knows the kind of the stage of Middle East strategy and diplomacy uh, extremely well. What, what do you see as the Saudi interest in Syria? I mean, I, I, I've talked to different people about different interests. What's the American interest in Syria? Mm. It, what's the Saudi interest in Syria? I, I've got my own theories, but I would like to hear yours first. Sure. The Saudis are, it's not only, Syria is one uh, front for the Saudis in a broader regional process, which is that the Saudis are terrified of Iranian regional ambitions. The Saudis do not feel that anybody else is doing sufficiently, uh, is doing enough to curb or hold back Iranian uh, advancement and ambitions, and therefore they are determined wherever they can to get involved to try to turn the Iranians back. Now, as the Saudis note, and as the rest of us note too, uh, the survival of the Assad regime is a cardinal interest for the Iranians. They have poured billions of dollars. This at a time when, as, as we know well, this country is under sanctions. They have poured billions of dollars, anything up to $10 billion, into helping the Assad regime. They've sent men. They've sent material. They are using their expertise. And they are determined that Assad survive. And that is because his survival forms part of a broader uh, Iranian uh, strategy whereby the Iranians hope to have a, a sort of land bridge all the way from their own border to the Mediterranean Sea. And that land bridge is to consist of the Maliki government in Iraq, which of course is moving closer and closer to the Iranians, Assad in Syria, and then the Hezbollah-dominated uh, Lebanon, and then the Mediterranean Sea. If any one of those links falls, then the whole project fails. And that's why the Iranians are so determined to ensure that Assad does not fall. And that is why the Saudis are so determined that he should fall, because they wish to frustrate that Iranian ambition as they seek to frustrate uh, Iranian ambitions elsewhere, also notably in the Gulf. And we remember the intervention into Bahrain uh, in early 2011 by a Saudi-led uh, Peninsula Shield 
military force and also elsewhere, also in Egypt, by the way. You know, so the Saudis are doing everything they can to hold the Iranians back because they are terrified of Iranian ambitions. And I would say that their increased activity in, in uh, Syria is part of that. There's another element, too. It's not only about Saudi-Iranian rivalry. It is also about Saudi-Qatar rivalry. The Saudis uh, have been furious, have been infuriated by the events of the last two years in which the alliance between Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood uh, organization has led to victory for the Muslim Brothers, also in Tunisia, also in Egypt, for a time at least, and also to a considerable extent in the Syrian insurgency and also in the Palestinian front in Bakken Hamas. And the Saudis are trying to turn back Qatari advances as well. So this is all about uh, geo-strategy for the Saudis. It's about their rivalries with Iran. It's about their rivalries with Qatar. And the Saudis have one instrument, really. They don't have a very broad or big uh, toolbox. They have one instrument, really, and that instrument is money and lots of it. And that's what they're throwing at Syria right now, it would appear. Uh, Saudi apparently then has some sort of common interest with Israel. Has there been any significant uh, conversation between the two countries? Well, this is a fascinating question, isn't it? Of course, on the public level, you will never hear of uh, anything of the kind. And it's one of those paradoxes which, uh, which the study of the Middle East uh, brings us because the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> excuse me, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is, uh, I can confidently say, uh, almost certainly the most anti-Semitic uh, regime currently in existence on the planet. And that includes the Iranians and that includes uh, Assad and, and whoever else. The Saudis are really up there in terms of if one looks at their education system, if one looks at their media, this is a virulently anti-Jewish and a virulently anti-Christian kingdom, as we are all aware. And yet, in the way that politics and common enemies make strange bedfellows, you're absolutely correct that right now, Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have a, uh, a central shared interest in turning back the ambitions of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Everything which I know of uh, in terms of, uh, of speaking to serving Israeli officials and so on tells me that there, is, uh, there are myriad and deep uh, links and conversations between the relevant Israeli and Saudi agencies, but that all of this, of course, takes place uh, behind the scenes and will not be reciprocated by open diplomatic uh, relations anytime soon between the two countries. No. Jonathan, if the Muslim Brotherhood is connected to Qatar and the Iranians are supporting Assad, who, what groups within Syria are the Saudis working with? Are they working with the secular military people? Or are they working with? I mean, I, I, I'm used to Barry Rubin's dichotomy between the the, the dictatorship and the and the the uh, the. Um, uh, the, you know, the Islamists on the on the mm -hmm. one hand, and then you've mm -hmm. got the pro democracy people. So, who are the Saudis working with? I, mean, I I don't understand what what groups they're appealing to. And this, I guess, would apply also in Egypt, where I think some of yeah. these similar conversations are going on. Yeah, it's uh, it applies also to Egypt. And fascinatingly, the Saudis are engaged both in Egypt and in Syria with precisely the same uh, type types of people and precisely the same organizations. As you correctly uh, note, or as we've correctly noted, the Saudis are terrified of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, it's worthwhile just pausing for a moment to understand why that is. After all, the Saudis themselves are, uh, are Islamists, or at least are, you know, are an, uh, a deeply uh, religious, Islamic, uh, ideological uh, kingdom. The Saudis are frightened of the Muslim Brothers because the Saudis are uh, hostile to uh, representative government. They don't have representative government, of course, in Saudi Arabia itself. And they think, and probably correctly, that if there is any one movement that could pose a threat to their own rule domestically, it would probably be the, uh, the Muslim Brothers. You know, secular Democrats are not going to have much to do in Saudi Arabia. But a movement that comes along wrapped in the mantle of Islam, Sunni Islam, as the Muslim Brothers do, is a movement that could have some kind of purchase in Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis are determined to stop their advance and have done very well in doing so in the, in the course of this year. Now, in terms of Syria, who are they working with as a result of that ambition? They are sophisticated and they are working in the Middle Eastern fashion, not with uh, one group of people, but with several groups of people. In the Syrian context, for example, they are working both with the Supreme Military Council 
of General uh, Idris, General Salim Idris, which uh, we would characterize as being secular officers. They're not really secular. I mean, nobody in the Middle East is really secular, but, you know, non-Islamist uh, military defectors from the Syrian Arab army of the type of General Idris, who, of course, are also supported by the West. That's the Western and U.S. client in the uh, Syrian arena. The Saudis are supporting him. General Idris and his uh, colleagues have visited Riyadh, and the relationship is, uh, is uh, strong. The Saudis are also supporting the civilian leadership of the Syrian National Coalition, and indeed the current leadership, Mr. Uh, Jarba, you know, is closely linked in clan through his clan uh, loyalties to the Saudis. But the Saudis are also backing Islamist fighters, including some pretty uh, extreme, pretty radical Islamist Salafi, non-Muslim Brotherhood Salafi Islamist fighting groups within Syria. And if we look at this uh, Jaish al-Islam, this Army of Islam, which was just founded, or the, the announcement of which was just made, or founding of which was just made on September 29th, we can see that Zahran Alush himself, the leader, is uh, a Salafi in terms of his outlook. And many of the component brigades are also Salafi, that is to say extreme uh, Islamist uh, in outlook. So the Saudis are simultaneously backing both the Western-backed coalition, the Supreme Military Council, but also large numbers of Salafi fighting groups on the ground. By the way, with regard to the latter point of support for Salafi fighting groups, pragmatically speaking, you know, this decision from the Saudi point of view makes some sense in the sense that it is these guys who are doing the actual fighting. That is to say, if one were to be determined to avoid support for all Islamist fighting groups, but at the same time to support the Syrian insurgency and rebellion, you'd be hard put to find anybody to support because the fact of the matter is and I've spent some time in Syria over the last year in the rebel-controlled areas, uh, among other areas. And the fact of the matter is that almost everybody you come across there who's doing any actual fighting is an Islamist of one kind or another. The Saudis are not backing the Muslim Brotherhood Islamists, but they are backing the non-Muslim Brotherhood Islamists. Uh, uh, Jonathan, what is the time frame we're dealing with in Syria? And how does it cor correlate with any uh, nuclear breakout uh, possible in Iran? Well, my sense of the, the time frame in Syria is that this civil war is set to continue for a long time because what uh, the most salient fact of the military situation on the ground right now is that there is a stalemate in place in Syria. And effectively, there has been a stalemate in place in Syria for the last year. I mean, there have been moments at which that stalemate in the course of the last year looked like being about to be broken by one or other of the sides. But that has not taken place. And Syria today has effectively, I would uh, suggest, ceased to exist as a state. There is no Syria today. There is a geographical area which is called Syria. But there is no unified Syrian state anymore. What there is, rather, uh, what has come into being are uh, three separate enclaves. The first of these in Damascus and the western part of the country, western coastal area, is controlled by President Bashar Assad and the uh, institutions of the former government or regime of all of Syria. There is a rebel-controlled area stretching from the east up to the northern border with Turkey, which is controlled by various uh, iterations and incarnations of Sunni Islamist rebels, sometimes in harmony with one another and sometimes in direct contact with one, conflict with one another on ideological or economic or practical uh, bases. And then in the northeast of the country, there is a smaller uh, Kurdish enclave controlled by the PYD, which is the Syrian franchise of the PKK uh, Kurdish uh, guerrilla organization. So there are three separate enclaves, and there are no indications whatsoever that any time soon those enclaves, any one of those enclaves is going to be conquered by any of the others. And there are no indications that any time soon these enclaves are going to be able to conduct a successful negotiation to bring about you know, a transition of government in Syria to a new government and a new uni unity for the country, which leads me to conclude that the time frame in Syria is very open-ended indeed. This fight could go on for a very long time. We remember that the Lebanese civil war dragged on for nearly 15 years and, it only, and only ended because in a certain point the Syrian army just came in and put a stop to it. But there's nobody to play the role of Syria in Syria. Yeah, there's nobody to play that role of the big brother who gets involved at a certain point and puts a stop to things. So I think this could go on for a very long time to come. Um, to some degree, independently of the Iranian 
nuclear issue. Of course, I hear a hint in your question, which I've heard this uh, this before, that could there be a possibility that the Iranians, when it comes to the negotiations in Geneva, are going to put Syria on the table and are going to say, well, in return for us having uh, having the right to enrich uranium or, or whatever it is, we will hand over, so to speak, our support for the Assad regime. It's possible, of course. We have to wait and see what happens in the negotiations. But I think it's quite unlikely because I think you know the Iranians have poured, as I said, anything up to $10 billion into this Assad regime over the last two and a half years. Assad's not militarily on the back foot. And I think it's quite unlikely that the Syrians will see him as a, the uh, Iranians rather, will see him as a card to be given up uh, in the negotiations over the nuclear uh, file. Do, Jonathan, do you see Iraq uh, deteriorating because of what's going on in Syria? I mean, I, I, I could see that the same groups are operating there, the Shia, the, the Sunni, and the Kurds. I mean, is there yeah. any possibility that Iraq becomes uh, destabilized and, and fighting just spreads to Iraq? Well, fighting has, has already, uh, David, has already spread to Iraq to some degree. I mean, it's, you know, were it not for the fact if I can put it, you know, perhaps slightly melodramatically, you know, were it not for the fact that much of the region is on fire, the fact of the matter is that events in Iraq would currently be a major news item. It's being virtually ignored because of the other huge stories transpiring in the region, in Syria and in Egypt, and with regard to the Iranian uh, nuclear question. But thousands of people literally have died uh, in fighting and in terrorism in Iraq over the last uh, Months, just a, a, thou a thousand people were killed just last month, if I'm not mistaken. Um, largely off the away from media visibility, there is uh, an emergent Sunni uprising in uh, Anbar province, which you know American listeners will, will, will remember will know the name well from the time of the American uh, military involvement in Iraq. Anbar province and in Nineveh province, close to the Syrian border, uh, Sunni insurgents often linked to the very self-same organizations, not only the same ethnicities or same families or clans, but the same organizations that are active in Syria. You know, these organizations uh, are gaining confidence from the Sunni uprising in uh, Syria to believe that the domination by Iraq, or the domination of Iraq rather, by the Shia majority uh, is not necessarily a fait accompli which they simply just have to accept. And as a result of that, you know, there is terrorism taking place and there is counter-terrorism taking place of a very robust type, we can say, from the Maliki uh, government. And the fight, the terrorism has even spread in recent weeks to the generally very peaceful northern Iraq, Kurdish northern Iraq. There was uh, a bombing or a couple of bombings in the Iraqi Kurdish capital of Erbil just a couple of weeks ago. And the organization that's taken responsibility for those bombings is the organization called Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, which is an organization very active in the fighting in Syria, and it is a franchise of Al-Qaeda. Um, not uh, metaphorically, you know, this is an organization directly taking orders from Ayman al-Zawahiri and the uh, Al-Qaeda-based leadership. Um, so yeah, the fighting has already spread to Iraq. It has not yet brought Iraq to the brink of civil war. It has not yet destabilized the country. But yeah, I think it has a long way to go. I think that the border between Iraq and Syria has largely become non-existent in some parts of the country. And just across what was the border are areas that are in the hands of jihadis and al-Qaeda affiliates, many of whom are linked by clan and familial loyalties to similar people just across the border in what is referred to as Iraq rather than Syria. So yeah, this has become a porous situation. And insofar as Syria no longer exists as a state. Iraq certainly does still exist. But the same forces that are operating in Syria are already visible and have already emerged in uh, Iraq. Let, let's switch for a moment to the Kurds. I know you've worked with the Kurds um, in Syria, at least at some point. And, yes. you know, there, there are Kurdish populations in Iraq that are connected to the Kurdish populations in Syria, that are connected to the Kurdish populations in other places. Are we Are we looking at... You know the potential formation of the of the Kurdish state that probably should have existed a hundred years ago, or or what's the situation there? Yeah, it, it's a huge question. I mean, the fact of the matter is that you know since uh, the 90s, really, there has existed an, a, um, a, a Kurdish entity in northern Iraq, but of but since the invasion of 2003 and the uh, the destruction 
of the Saddam Hussein regime, the level of autonomy enjoyed by this uh, entity has you know, vastly increased. And I think it would be a fair argument to make that northern Iraq, to all intents and purposes, already constitutes something very close to sovereignty. You know, if you fly into the airport at Erbil, as I have done uh, many times, you will not see a single Iraqi national flag in the entire airport. The flag you'll see is the flag of Kurdistan. Mm. The first language used in the airport is Kurdish. Arabic and and English just follow on. Perhaps more tellingly, the Kurds are running their own visa regime uh, into Erbil. If I want to go to Baghdad, I have to get uh, a visa from the Iraqi embassy in my local uh, city, capital city, but if I, which in the Israeli case, there's not one, but in London or in Washington or wherever, but uh, if I want to fly to Erbil, I just get a ticket and fly there. The Kurds are running their own visa regime. They have their own armed forces. They are closing their own deals with regard to oil exploration in the very oil-rich region they have. So to all intents and purposes, there is already a Kurdish quasi-sovereignty in northern Iraq. Now, in the course of the last two years, basically since the summer of 2012, a Kurdish autonomous region has also emerged in northeast Syria, as I mentioned a moment ago. Now, this uh, Kurdish Syrian region is, is territorially contiguous to the Iraqi Kurdish region. It's one block of land bisected by the notional border between uh, Iraq and Syria. So I would argue that the situation is better for the Kurds now than at any time since the early 1920s when they you know, when they lost their, their bid, so to speak, or their hopes for sovereignty of one kind or another. The, ho- the, the situation is better for them now than at any time in the last 90 years for them to try to push forward to some kind of sovereignty or another in the years ahead. They have to be very careful, of course, to play their game very careful, very, with great caution because there is not yet a single united Kurdish national movement. There are a number of rival movements bidding for that uh, crown. And Turkey, where you know the greater number of Kurds nevertheless are resident, Turkey remains deeply uh, concerned at the possibility of Kurdish sovereignty, and particularly with regard to the entity that has emerged in northeast Syria, which, after all, is controlled by a local franchise of the PKK organization, which has been involved in a very bloody guerrilla war against the Turks since 1984. Now, it's a very long border between uh, Syria and Turkey. It's around 900 kilometers border. And the Kurdish entity in northeast Syria is not particularly deep, but it's, but it's long. It goes all the way along the border. It, the Kurds now control around 500 kilometers of border between, uh, between uh, Syria and Turkey. And the Turks are deeply worried at the prospect of that in the future being used for guerrilla war on behalf of the Turkish Kurds. So it's a complex diplomatic and strategic and political and military game which the Kurds are going to need to play successfully in the years ahead. But they have a greater chance, I would say now, of reaching statehood and sovereignty than they've had certainly within living memory and going back even a couple of generations. Uh, Jonathan, does NATO play anything, any role in the Middle East these days? Well, not really. I mean, not, not certainly in our neighborhood. Of course, NATO uh, was the framework for the Western uh, intervention in Afghanistan, which is now drawing to a close. And I would suggest, I, I don't look at Afghanistan so closely, but I would suggest not to a particularly successful uh, close in spite of the very great sacrifices made by Western servicemen in the course of the last uh, decade now. Um, but other than the framework of uh, of uh, Afghanistan, you know, NATO is not uh, it's not a framework which we're coming up against particularly uh, in our region. It has been spoken of. It was spoken of at one time, of course, as a possible alternative framework for Western intervention into Syria, um, in the same way that it was used, you know, in the past with regard to Western intervention into the Balkans in the 1990s, but. As we are all aware, the political will for that among major NATO member states simply was not there. So this was some. This was an idea, which largely was uh, was stillborn. And so I think NATO is talked about as a kind of possible uh, player in all kinds of contexts in the Eastern Mediterranean, but none of these really have come to fruition in any uh, in any meaningful so way. We're we're leaving out a big country here. What what, what about Russia? 
Well, the Russians, as we know, have uh, have been very successful in the last year in playing what I think everybody would agree is a not particularly good hand in the Middle East. You know, the Russians, at, or then the Soviets, at the zenith of their uh, involvement in the region in the uh, 50s and 60s, controlled many and powerful allies in the Arab world. Of course, Syria, which has been aligned to them for a long time, but also Egypt was aligned with them, the largest and most important Arab state. They had allies further afield in Iraq at one time, also in South Yemen. So they had many clients. All of that is long gone. The only thing which is left is Assad's uh, Syria. Of course, we should remember the Palestinian National Movement was also a client of uh, the Soviet bloc you know, throughout the Cold War. All that's gone. All that's left for the Russians in the eastern Mediterranean is Assad's Syria. But, that's, but given that very small number of assets, they've nevertheless played that pretty well. The fact of the matter is that when the uprising broke out against Assad, the Russians knew how to back their man to the hilt. There was never any question of them deserting him, and they made sure to keep the flow of weaponry, you know, in weapon ships going from the ports of Novorossiysk and Oktobersk in, uh, in, in Black Sea in Russia and in uh, southern Ukraine, all the way, you know, up into the Mediterranean and to the port of Tartus in Syria, bringing that vital material for Assad's survival. And they've converted that military help, first of all, into military gain. That's to say Assad would probably be, be nothing more than a memory now, were it not for the Russians standing by him. And as we also saw in recent weeks with regard to the issue of chemical weapons, the Russians also knew how to turn that into diplomatic gain. It is they, after all, who were the ones who brokered, who proposed and brokered the deal which was eventually accepted by the Syrian regime, probably under pressure from the Russians to accept it, which, of course, saved President Obama from what many analysts consider would probably have been a deeply embarrassing defeat uh, in Congress with regard to military action of a, of a similar type to the defeat, of course, suffered by, by British Prime Minister uh, David Cameron in, in the British Parliament over his proposal for military action. The Russians saved President Obama from such an embarrassing uh, moment, and in doing so, I think, came out with very considerably increased uh, diplomatic prestige. And let us also remember, with regard to this chemical weapons deal uh, about, uh, of, uh, of Assad, uh, about Assad regime, that Assad may well be cooperating with regard to the turning over of his chemical weapons, as we've seen in the media over the last 48 hours. The initial reports are good. But let's remember that in cooperating with that proposal, Assad has also turned himself from the target of the uh, potential military aggression on the, or military action on the part of the international community. He's turned himself from that, from the potential target of, uh, of military action, into the essential partner of the international community. Because, of course, of course, after all, it's only Assad and his regime and his army that can help the, uh, rid, the rid Syria of chemical weapons. So for as long as that process is continuing, he has to stick around. So from the Russian point of view, given that the Russian goal is to preserve Assad, this isn't a bad day's work. The Russians may have very limited interests in the region. They may be playing a somewhat nihilistic role, you might say, where they're simply trying to make the Americans look bad as bad as they can. But if that's what they're trying to do, they're playing a limited hand very effectively, I would suggest. Let's, let's move south a little bit. Uh, and and let's, talk, let's talk Africa here, North Africa. We've got, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the situation in Egypt alone, I think, is very troubling to me with, with the United States talking about uh, holding back foreign aid from the Egyptian military, yeah. their, their consequences... Uh, with the Israeli-Egyptian peace agreement in that, there's there's the instability uh, potentially for the Egyptian military government. Um, you know, I could see the Saudis potentially stepping in like they're doing in in uh, in Syria, and then we could potentially have virtually no influence over over the Egyptian government at that point. What what are your thoughts here? First of all, with regard to the Saudis, I think it's vital that we understand that they have already stepped in. They and the United Arab Emirates were the bankrollers for, the, for the, the coup of General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in uh, early July of this year. They were the first to congratulate Sisi on the coup, and they have made good the financial uh, losses incurred 
by the withdrawal of Qatari money, who the Qataris being, of course, the main backers of the Muslim Brotherhood government. I would suggest, although I have no proof of this, but uh, without getting into, you know, conspiracy theories or, or something, I would suggest it'll probably become apparent uh, at a certain stage that the Saudis themselves were very much aware of what General al-Sisi and his colleagues were planning prior to July 2013 and were involved in it to some degree. This is to some degree at least a Saudi uh, production. They were uh, determined to uh, bring down the Muslim Brothers in Egypt and they succeeded in doing so. So they're already in there. Now, if I think, we, yeah. yeah right. if, if, we assume that, if we assume that this is, is fairly uh, reasonable knowledge, can, can we assume that the United States already is operating based on the fact that they could potentially shift some of this responsibility to Saudi Arabia? I mean, I, I'm kind of wondering what the thought process is here of, of what the, the, the implications of withdrawing American money, if you know somebody else is going to step in, um, and yeah. and fund it. What's the purpose of the United States backing out, uh, dealing with the regime? It's obviously not just to save money. There's got to be something else going on there. Sure. Oh no, it's not just about saving money. Um, the thing is that the Saudis are not really going to be able to step in to play the kind of role which which America plays, because of course the Saudis have nothing like the military skills and abilities which you know mm. which the peerless. Uh, uh, United States military has now when it comes or military and military industries have now when it comes to such issues as the F-35 you know supplying the F-35 aircraft to Egypt or supplying parts for uh, M1, A1, you know, Abrams tanks which the Egyptian army uses and these are the kind of things that the Egyptians now apparently are not going to be getting nobody's going to be able to step in and provide those kind of things if America doesn't provide them then the Egyptians simply are not going to get them now I think this ra does raise a number of interesting questions. And, and first and foremost, yeah, why is America doing this? As I understand it, this derives not from some kind of geostrategic uh, thinking, but rather from uh, values-based thinking. That is to say, the United States does not help countries which carry out military coups, we are told. Uh, General al-Sisi carried out something which, you know, was a military coup in early uh, July. And the fact that it was carried that he carried out that coup against a radically anti-Western movement, which appeared to be using its position in government to dismantle the basis of Egypt of any possibility of Egyptian constitutional government in the future, apparently doesn't uh, appear in the mix. So General El Sisi is being punished. It seems a fairly limited punishment by all accounts, but is being given a kind of symbolic punishment for having carried out a military coup and for not with sufficient speed uh, moving back towards democracy in Egypt and, and for, I guess, with a degree of uh, excessive rigor, so to speak, acting militarily and politically to repress the Muslim Brotherhood. He's being punished for that. Now, can I just say, from an Israeli point of view, uh, this all looks uh, somewhat uh, inadvisable, if I can put it like that. Israel regards General al-Sisi as a very reliable ally, Everyone who I speak to in the uh, military establishment in Israel says that the levels of military and intelligence cooperation between Israel and Egypt have increased considerably since the military coup. The Egyptian military is acting with a hard hand, a tough hand, against the Islamists and jihadis in northern Sinai. And from an Israeli point of view, there's something a little bit baffling about this. Here's a guy who wants to be an ally why is he being punished for acting against people who are clearly and openly anti-Western? Oh. That's what appears to be happening. Well, and, and, and I don't want to be conspiratorial either, but it seems to me that there's a possibility here that by the U.S. doing this action, they almost give al-Sisi an open door to act much stronger against Gaza than he otherwise would have. I mean, let, it, as long as the pen, as long as the punishment for withholding that uh, you know the foreign aid is still hanging over him, he has some apprehension. But at this point, he could pretty much just finish it all off and then say, "Well, it's done." Um, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering if if that's if if that's the case. Uh, I yeah, can well, see it. I can see it as an option. Whether it's whether it's the like whether it's what's really going on or not is a different issue. But I can at least see it as an option. Sure, I think so. I mean, you know, it's been clear. The, the administration made clear that it was not withholding uh, material material that CC and Egypt, Egypt might need for conducting uh, counter terrorist operations, which presumably would include 
what's happening uh, in Sinai and elsewhere against Islamist uh, terror groups. So, you know, they're not going to be sort of hobbled in any way uh, in their abilities in that regard. And yeah, they've been acting, you know, in a very tough way in northern Sinai. And also with regard to, as you know, with regard to blocking Hamas's ability to bring goods and weaponry and people in and out of Gaza to northern Sinai and back again. And I suspect this will this will continue. I think that uh, Sisi is going to win this. I mean, I, I think that he has, you know, put the Muslim Brotherhood into a corner politically and militarily from which it has no real escape. It cannot acquiesce to his rule. They have He has blocked its political return, but it has no real military option. If it goes towards insurgency, as it looks like it may be doing, it will have no chance of victory against the Egyptian armed forces. So I think, I find it fascinating as, you know, as a student of conflict, as I, as we Middle Eastern uh, analysts must inevitably be, you know, we're all told in this uh, modern age or postmodern age that there's no such thing as victory and that in asymmetric conflicts there are never winners and never losers. My sense is that General al-Sisi is on the way to handing the Muslim Brotherhood a good uh, old-fashioned and unambiguous uh, defeat. And I think it's good for Israel and it's good for the West. On the other hand, in the United States, there are constituencies who see the American administration as having supported the Muslim Brotherhood in the hope that it would be more viable than some of the more egregious uh, terrorist organizations. Does that have any weight at all right now, or is that gone? To my way of thinking, that never had any weight, but it certainly was a widely held belief you know, for, a, for a while, there was a sense that the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, which is clearly uh, popular, clearly has is popular in many Arab countries, there was a sense, that which there was a case which was made for quite some time in the course of the last uh, few years, also prior, by the way, to the election of the current, uh, the current U.S. president, you know, a case being made in the professional echelon, which said, well, the Muslim Brotherhood actually is the, the uh, is analogous to conservative religious movements in the West, in North America, in Europe, who don't necessarily have any problem functioning and working successfully in the context of democracy. And given that that is the case, they should be given their chance. Well, it was always, I think, a fairly poor argument that ignored a lot of the facts with regard to this Muslim Brotherhood organization and its many franchises throughout the region. I think now, having you know, now having the experience of Muslim Brotherhood government in Gaza, Hamas, of course, being the Palestinian franchise of the Muslim Brotherhood, and more significantly and importantly, uh, on a regional level, the experience of, you know, just over a year of Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt, I think, you know, most people aren't making that case anymore. And it is understood that the Muslim Brotherhood belongs in that list of movements which was prepared to make a sophisticated use of democracy in order to end democracy and bring in a type of rule of a very different kind. I, I think just, that's the way which is understood now. I just wonder what's being taught on college campuses, <clears throat> because it does take some time for, for uh, different trends to filter into what's being taught. But uh, in certain cases that we're aware of, there are individuals who were supporters of the mother, Muslim Brotherhood. And care, particularly. And care. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's very troublesome because the college students then are imbibing what may well be a unfactual, un, unwarranted uh, approach. Yeah, well, I, deep, I share your concern. I mean, you know, as somebody who I'm not directly involved in sort of in university teaching, but I'm certainly, you know, I certainly follow as closely as I can the trends in Middle East studies uh, departments, both in North America and in Europe. And yeah, I think it's a very troubling process indeed. In, in, in fact, I, I would be among those people who would say that the very you know, discipline of Middle East studies as an intellectual and academic discipline over the last couple of decades has been brought into disrepute because of uh, politicized scholarship and because of politicization and because of the use of uh, the academic uh, stage, so to speak, as a, uh, a vehicle for propaganda and political propaganda and indeed disinformation. And I think this has been hugely problematic and it has reduced the number of competent uh, Middle East experts and analysts being produced by the academy precisely at a time 
when there is a desperate need for real rigorous knowledge of the region in its very and its various uh, uh, parts and that's something of which for which we all pay the price but jonathan we haven't talked much about iran and mm-hmm. and uh the, the possibility of of some sort of negotiated solution with potentially reduced sanctions on iran um, and also, uh, there's news today, just on the, the headline of uh, the Times of Israel, um, that the uh, IAF conducted a long-range drill over Greek waters, uh, which would seem to, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, give an indication that there's preparation going on for the, for at least to try to increase the threat of uh, military mm-hmm. action against Iran, if not actual capability. What, what are your thoughts about Iran and what's going on right now? Yeah, well, first of all, I think that we have to understand that the sanctions that were put in place over the last years, three, four years, the real, you know, the tough sanction regime that came into, into being has, has really genuinely hit at the Iranian economy, you know, and specifically in two areas, two vital areas. Firstly, in the area of, uh, of finance and, and, and the access of Iranian uh, business to global financial uh, transactions. And secondly, of course, in terms of Iran's ability to export uh, oil. And this has really hit hard at the Iranian uh, economy and therefore also at Iranian society. And I think that the Iranian regime would like to see an end to the sanctions. And my own sense is that Hassan Rouhani was allowed to be elected, so to speak, by the real powers in Iran in order that he would have the mission of presenting a case internationally which would bring... Uh, an end to or a reduction in those sanctions. That's what I think we are witnessing. However, I think there are no indications and there is no reason to believe that this desire to reduce the impact of the sanctions goes hand in hand with a genuine desire to end the military nuclear program, which has been the subject of immense effort and immense investment by the Iranian regime going back, you know, certainly more than, you know, going back a decade and a half at least now. No indications at all, which leads me to the conclusion that what we are witnessing is a massive uh, PR campaign, which is taking place when the Iranians understand they are getting towards the home stretch with regard to uranium enrichment and with regard to the development of the military side, the rocket and missile side, and with regard to eventually putting those two together to test, to create and test a nuclear weapon. It's not that far away now. They only need to keep the diplomacy going for a while longer. And if they can manage, while continuing to develop the nuclear program, to bring about at least a partial reduction in sanctions, then that will be a huge achievement for them and, of course, a huge defeat for the West, which is why, in my estimation, the most important thing to bear in mind as we enter the negotiations now, the P5 plus one, you know, negotiating with Iran, is that a deal must be all or nothing. It should not be, it must not be the case that the Iranians win incremental reductions in the sanctions in return for supposedly incremental concessions on their part. That's exactly what they want. That's the shortest way to ensuring uh, a year, two years down the line, an embarrassing or indeed a a defeat for the West and for Israel of historic uh, proportions when it becomes clear either that Iran tests a nuclear weapon or that Iran has now reached that breakout phase from which it can no longer be prevented uh, from testing a nuclear weapon should it choose to do so. Um, we haven't even talked Israel. So what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on, on the peace negotiations right now? What are you hearing um, from, from within Israel and, uh, you know, about, about these peace negotiations? And when, what are your thoughts moving forward? We only have, we only have a few minutes left, so. Sure. Well, frankly, you know, I never uh, had an enormous amount of uh, faith in these peace negotiations because it always, you know, the, the same factors which have frustrated Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations now going back two decades are present in the current time, and indeed they're present uh, with, in, with additional elements to them. That's to say, the, 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 bare, the bare fact that if one takes the positions of the two sides, it's very clear, and it has been demonstrated time and time again now, that the uh, maximum which Israel feels itself able to offer is far less than the minimum which Palestinian mainstream nationalism feels itself able to accept, and that therefore there's no real basis for a peace deal. It is a fact that the Palestinian national movement, Fatah included, 
you know, remains to be the movement of the return, the movement of al auda fundamentally. The Palestinian National Movement has never been the movement for creating a small Palestinian state. That looks like defeat to Palestinian nationalism in terms of its basic sense of itself. That's always been the case. But since 2007, we now have a situation in which there is no longer a single Palestinian National Movement. There are now two Palestinian National Movements, and only one of them, and arguably not necessarily the most powerful or impressive of the two, only one of them is even willing to sit at a table with Israel. So even if by some miracle in the course of the remaining, I can't remember, it was nine months, and so now there's a remaining, I guess, seven and a half months to reach a final status accord, even if by some miracle the Ramallah-based PA and Israel did manage to achieve that, this in any case would not be binding on the entirety of the Palestinian national movement. There's a whole territory down there in the Gaza Strip ruled by a very different and rival version of Palestinian nationalism. So I think the whole thing, to a great extent, is something of a charade. I think both sides, to some degree, are kind of going through the motions here. I think that the Palestinians, the Ramallah, the Ramallah Palestinian Authority, is committed, I think, to a strategy of trying to force concessions from Israel through activity on the international stage, in the UN, and in other uh, global bodies. And I think right now, this Ramallah-based PA is marking time before returning to that strategy. What I think it will do is at the end of nine months, or even maybe before that, the Palestinian Authority will leave the talks, attempt to blame Israel for their failure, and then return back to that policy of, of uh, seeking to pressurize Israel and seeking to delegitimize Israel uh, in global bodies. Jonathan, I'll give you a, a, just, just a couple of minutes here to talk about what you're working on and, and what you do. Um, what would you like to have people look at? Where can they find you on the web uh, mm -hmm. and, and your, your books and your projects? Sure. Well, right now, as I said, I'm, I'm working very, very closely on Syria and, uh, and Lebanon. I've, I've visited, I've reported from Syria on three occasions in the course of the last year. I'm writing more or less on a, you know, I'm, I'm observing and researching and working with a whole bunch of colleagues and clients, you know, more or less on a daily basis, observing the Syrian civil war and analyzing it down to the very minutiae of detail. And we work closely with a number of foreign embassies and, and official bodies here in Israel in terms of trying to get that understanding uh, clear. And there's a very public side to that in terms of the journalism that I do for the Jerusalem Post and elsewhere. Now, all of that can be found on my website, jonathanspire.com, and it can also be found on the Gloria uh, Global Research and International Affairs Center website. Um, I also, as, as you mentioned, I have my book out now a couple of years old, The Transforming Fire, The Rise of the Israel-Islamist Conflict, which looks at a lot of the same issues, but uh, I guess from a slightly uh, deeper you know, book length uh, level. Um, what we're trying to do really is to combine, as I see it at least, you know, on the spot reporting and real regional knowledge with a, a deeper political analysis and trying to sort of get the strengths of both reporting and analysis into what hopefully is a product which gives uh, as clear a picture as possible of the Middle Eastern reality, and specifically in my particular case of the Syrian and Lebanese realities, which is what I'm, uh, I'm mainly focusing on at the present time. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Jonathan Spire, for joining us on Understanding the World. Uh, next week on Understanding the World, we have uh, Phyllis Chesler, author of An American Bride in Kabul, who will be our guest. And we're uh, greatly looking forward to having her on the show as well. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you next week on Understanding the World. Shalom. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Yes, now your favorite programs on Webcast One Live can all be watched and listened to on any Android or Apple device. Your phone, tablet, or iPad. Yes, your favorite shows on Webcast One Live are available live or on podcast wherever you go. Let me introduce to you some of our great shows. 
Shalom. Every week on Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman, we'll talk about issues in the Middle East, issues related to the Jewish tradition and religious traditions in general, and keep you up to date on exactly what's going on around the world. You may know some of the story, but you haven't heard all of the story until you've heard it on Understanding the World with Rabbi David Kaufman and our special guests we have on every week. Hi, I'm Doc. You listen to me every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. on Doc and Lefty Radio Podcast Program, where we discuss all the relevant topics of the day, including state, local, and national politics. My partner in crime, Lefty, often likes to have a little bit of conservative justice served upon him. So please turn in for the fireworks every week from 6 to 7 p.m. on Tuesdays at webcast1live.com. Thank you. So when you want to watch your favorite Webcast One program, remember, there's an app for that. You know, there's an app for that. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. 